of our, both of our societies uh, some decades ago. For example, in 1957, uh, when the Soviet Union launched Sputnik, uh, the world's first man-made satellite that orbited the Earth successfully. Uh, back in the USA, everybody freaked out about this. Uh, they didn't like being behind in space and said, oh my God, uh, we got to catch up. We have to get a satellite into orbit in 90 days, which seems crazy. And it was, uh, our first attempt blew up on the launch pad. Uh, but the second attempt succeeded. That was January 31st, 1958. It was almost 120 days after that initial launch. It's pretty fast by modern standards. Then in April 1961, Yuri Gagarin became the first human being to orbit the Earth. And again, uh, that made news all over the world. Everybody was very impressed by that. And back in the United States, uh, people were upset because again, we we're behind. We were behind in what was becoming clear was the space race. And we didn't like that. And what were we going to do about it? So um, in May 1961, one month after that flight, uh, our president at the time, Kennedy, made a speech to Congress saying, like, look, if we're going to catch up and not be behind forever, we have to do something big. We have to commit a lot of money, a lot of resources. We're going to go to the moon, right? And that was kind of a crazy idea. And in 1962, he reiterated this in a famous public speech. And he said, look, we're going to go to the moon before the decade is over. And that was crazy. It was really crazy because we hadn't done anything remotely like that. Um, but lo and behold, uh, eventually we did. So Apollo 11 launched on July 16th, 1969, um, before the decade was over. And just this year, uh, there's a very good documentary that came out about this whole mission. Um, what it is, is it's made of all original footage that NASA, NASA took during the mission that's been sitting away in cupboards and closets, and they restored the footage, and they sort of made a recreation of what it was like to live through this mission. And I'm going to play a short excerpt uh, from that documentary just to give you uh, a sense of what the scale of this whole thing was like. It's a lot, and it's crazy. We, we went from nothing to all that stuff in something like 12 years. Before Sputnik flew, we didn't have much of a space program in the United States, and in the end, we had all that stuff. And then, of course, after that, we continued to do space things, right? We made this space shuttle. It seemed like a really cool thing. It's like a ship out of science fiction. It could, like, take off and then land again. That's so great, right? Problem is, actually, most of it couldn't land, like those tanks in the background there. And therefore, it was very expensive to fly. Uh, and it was very unreliable. People died on this on a couple of different missions, and we decided to stop using it for all these reasons. So after that, if we wanted to put people in orbit, we had to get a ride on the Soyuz. Uh, and then from there, the trajectory of our space program kept going downwards. Uh, and so if you talk to somebody like me, sometime around the year 2002 or 2005, we all had this attitude like, isn't it a shame? Like the USA used to do all this cool stuff in space and now we like don't really do anything and the science fiction future that we visualized isn't really going to happen and we don't ever see that changing and, but what can you do about it? Oh well, shrug, right? That was just everybody's attitude. Uh, but not quite everybody, right? At some point somebody came along who'd made a bunch of uh, money on a website and said, hey, um, I want to do something about this. Despite having no rocket experience, I'm going to start a company to launch rockets and to do bigger stuff than we've ever done before. And so here's an excerpt of a video about why he did that stuff. Um, ben, there's 
becoming a multi-planet species and space-faring civilization. This is not inevitable. It's very important to appreciate this is not inevitable. The sustainable energy future, I think, is largely inevitable, uh, but being space spring civilization is definitely not inevitable. If you look at, the, uh, at the, the progress in space, in 1969, we were able to send somebody to the moon. 1969. Mm. Um, then we had the, the space shuttle. The, the space shuttle could only take people to low Earth orbit. Mm. Then the space shuttle retired, and the United States could take no one to orbit. So that's the trend. The trend is like down to nothing. This is not... People are mistaken when they think that technology just automatically improves. It does not automatically improve. It only improves if a lot of people work very hard to make it better. And actually, it will, I think, by itself degrade, actually. Mm -hmm. You look at great civilizations like ancient Egypt, and they're able to make the pyramids and they forgot how to do that. Mm. And, and the Romans, they built these incredible aqueducts. They forgot how to do it. So his idea was pretty successful. Uh, and today we're like landing rockets, and we're seriously talking about doing another moon mission as soon as the year 2024. We'll see if that actually happens, uh, but we're at least talking about it seriously, and that's a pretty good thing given where we were not long ago. Um, so Elon talked about a few things from the past that were great achievements that have been lost, and I wanted to go through a few more of those to reiterate his point that technology automatically degrades. Uh, this thing here that you see is the Lycurgus Cup. Uh, this was a relic uh, found uh, and dated back to the Roman Empire, 300 AD, and it's made of glass, and this glass that it's made of is the world's earliest known nanomaterial. Okay? The color of the glass changes based on how you look at it, like where the light source is. So if you're looking at it standing in front of the glass and the light source is sort of over here with you so that you're seeing it with reflected light, then the goblet is green. But if light is passing through it, uh, the goblet is red. They had this in 300 AD, right? And then the Roman Empire fell and that knowledge was lost uh, until basically forever. <laughs> um, the way this worked was actually, you know, it got figured out around 1990. Um, the glass is suffused with very small particles of silver and gold. By very small, I mean 50 to 70 nanometers, which is so small you would not be able to see them with a physical microscope. You would require an electron microscope to see these particles, right? But at some point, the Roman Empire fell and they forgot how to do it. Um, a lot of craftsmanship went into this. Uh, you could see you know, how it's hollowed out on the inside where the little guy's body is to give him more of a purple sheen as opposed to a red in the background. And if you hear people talk about this today or you, or you read up on this, um, they tend to have a dismissive attitude toward it. Like, oh, the stupid Romans didn't understand technology. They probably didn't even know it was silver and gold that made this happen. Uh, it was probably just an accident and they made like five of these, right? Which is complete nonsense. Like anybody who actually builds things as opposed to just writing about them knows you do not get a result this good without a constant process of iteration and refinement. You can imagine there was some initial accident, like maybe somebody wanted to make glass sparkly and they tried to put silver and gold in it and then they noticed a little bit of discoloration and they said, like, why is that there? And maybe they pursued that, like, what happens when I change the proportions, right? What, how thick should the glass be? Like, engineering results this good takes a long time. And what that means is that in Rome, people were doing something that we would recognize today as material science. And then that was lost. Other stuff happened, like in the Byzantine Empire, they had flamethrowers, and not like little dinky things. They had giant pressurized vessels in the bellies of ships that shot out a napalm-like substance out of metal tubes that they would use to incinerate neighboring vessels. Um, it was napalm-like in the sense that like, water would not put this fire out. Right? It was a very serious weapon. It was a state secret of the Byzantine Empire. They used it to defend Constantinople over and over again for hundreds of years until one day they couldn't really do that anymore for whatever reason. And this military secret just faded from knowledge. Nobody knows how to do it now. Right? Obviously, we've reinvented flamethrowers, but they're different. Um, this is the Antikythera mechanism. 
which is named after an island in uh, Greece where this was found on a sunken ship. It was just a corroded hunk of metal or a number of corroded hunks of metal, but it was very clear uh, when they were originally discovered that gears were involved. And over time, people analyzed this. They realized it's a mechanical calendar that was used to say things like, you know, what, what year is it? What are the phases of the moon? Where are the planets going to be right now? When is the next Olympic Games, right? And people have uh, run scans on, on what is left of this and managed to deduce what all the gears were in this mechanism. And it's very different from what I thought. When I first heard news about this, I thought like, oh, they must have had some cute little gear things in Greece. That's surprising. Uh, but let me just show you the scale of the generally agreed upon reconstruction of what this device actually was. That seems like a lot of gears, right? But wait, <laughs> there's more. So ancient Greece had that, but that is not the picture that we have today of ancient Greece, right? And the thing to realize is you don't just get here from nothing. It's not like one day there weren't any gears and then the next day some guy makes this, right? You need a whole process of science to create something that sophisticated. And we don't know anything about that today, right? All of that was lost. And I could go on and on with examples. There's a whole bunch of things from history that are like this. But we don't have time. I uh, <laughs> just want to restate that right now we live in a very privileged time uh, where technology has been in a good shape for a long time. We see it getting better. And so we imagine that the natural course of history is that technology always improves and that these moments in history are just like little blips or something that we heard about. But they're not just little blips. It's actually sort of the regular course of world history that great achievements in technology just get completely lost because the civilizations that made those achievements fell or, you know, had a sort of a soft fall where they failed to propagate the knowledge into the future, right? Technology goes backward all the time, and not just in ancient history, also in the modern day, right? We lose knowledge all the time. So I'm going to read an excerpt from an interview with Bob Colwell, who was the chief microprocessor architect at Intel for a while. Uh, but this interview is from before that. It was from the booming days of Silicon Valley when he worked at a startup called Multiflow. They were trying to make a very large instruction word processor when that was a new experimental idea. Um, and they were having a lot of problems. Like when you try to design the chip, you're using components from other manufacturers. And he just couldn't get anything to work reliably. And he was like, what, what the hell, right? So he says... Um, Rich Lethen and I made a pilgrimage down to Texas Instruments in Richardson, Texas, and we said, as best as we can tell, many of your chips don't work properly, and does this come as a surprise to you? I half expected them to say, what, you're out of your mind, you've done something wrong? Come on, you don't know what you're doing, go use somebody else's chips. But no, they said, yeah, we know, let me see your list. And they looked at the list and said, well, here's some more that you don't know about. And by the way, it wasn't just TI. Their parts were no worse than anybody else's. Motorola's were no good. Fairchild's were no good. They all had this problem. And so I asked TI, how did the entire industry fall on its face at the same time? We are killing ourselves trying to work around the shortcomings in your silicon. And the guy said, the first generation of transistor logic was done by the old graybeard guys who really knew what they were doing. The new generation was done by kids who are straight out of school who didn't know to ask what the change in packaging would do to inductive spikes, right? So when you change the voltage in places on a chip, it generates a magnetic field because that's just what happens. And when those fields interact across a chip, bad, it's bad, right? And 
the, you know, the new people designing these chips didn't know uh, to take that seriously. Um, and that's why technology degrades, or it's at least one reason, right? It takes a lot of energy and effort to communicate from generation to generation uh, these important things that you need to know in order to do a competent job making the technology. And there are losses in that communication process, almost inevitably. And without this generational transfer of knowledge, civilizations can die because the technology that those civilizations depend on degrades and fails. 